you know, studying it now and looking back, I think the change of events here was I felt very out of control. Um, I felt a lot of shame. I didn't have anybody to turn to. And I wanted to control something. So I started to do that. I'm Megan Armstrong. Welcome to Life Six Feet Above. Six Feet Above was created when I started to share my story of spending 16 years wanting to be six feet under to now living a life full and happy six feet above. The more that I started to talk about my journey, my struggles, and my past, the more I realized people were genuinely interested and not judgmental at all, which is what I'd feared for so long. In fact, Other people wanted to talk about their story as well, and for some reason they trusted me to do so. So the Six Feet Above podcast is my way of helping to share other people's stories, finding out what works for them to create a life of happiness. Before we start this episode, I want to let you know it has some explicit language and some very serious subject matter. It may be triggering or sensitive to certain people. Please listen with discretion. This is Aaron's story. So welcome back to the Six Feet Above podcast. This is episode 25 with Aaron Meeson, um, who is, like most of my guests, somebody that I met in the fitness world. And I think that's going to be a theme for this season as well. So welcome, Aaron, to the show. Is this your first podcast? This is my first podcast. I honestly am like really nervous. Are you? Are you nervous that just like because we're recording it or nervous about actually sharing your story? Or both? I think a little bit of both. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I've shared my story in other contexts, mm-hmm. but never in this sort of context. Yeah. So yeah, I'm like a little bit nervous, but it's like excitement yes. and nervous. Yes. It's one of those things <laughs> where I tell everybody, I'm like, once you get done, it just feels like this, like therapy's great and all that's yeah. awesome. But there's something about putting it out in the world where it's like, it's there forever Mm. that you just feel like, like the weights off your shoulders. And then when your episode comes out and you, people start reaching out to you that you're like, okay, it was all worth it. So what was it about? What was it about me reaching out and asking you to do it that you finally said like, yes, I'll do it. Even though it is a little bit nerve nerve wracking. Mm. You know, I have, I think I've mentioned this to you, Mm -hmm. but I'm in grad school right Uh now to become a therapist and Mm -hmm. I'm finishing up my internship and all through my internship, I've been working with um, a lot of adolescents, a lot of young adults um, who, without going into any detail, have experienced a lot of trauma yeah. in their lives and it's very inspiring for me to work with them mm-hmm. and see okay someone who has been through not to compare at all because comparing trauma or experiences is no it's not beneficial right. but right. seeing seeing that and seeing it in real life like this person has been through something extremely traumatizing and is brave enough to work through it Mm -hmm. and I think being there as they share their story with me and get very vulnerable um it kind of has inspired me to like you know it's okay for me to share mine as well right it's okay to do scary things yeah yeah Yeah. it's freeing it's very free. Yeah. So Aaron and I met probably, I don't even know, four or five years, years ago. Um, we worked together at Cycle Bar for like a split second. Literally. Like literally <laughs> a split second. I was like, okay, I can't have like two things right now going on. Um, but we've we've <laughs> kept in touch and you've always been super supportive. Like I remember when I released the first season you were just so complimentary and um I've actually interviewed your boss at turn so, oh yeah so Erin is a, a spin instructor she's also a yogi yeah. so you're a certified yoga instructor um what else are you doing right now for work 
besides, I mean, I know you're back to school, but yeah. you're at turn and then are you teaching yoga somewhere else or just yoga at turn? So I'm not currently, well, I teach yoga at turn, right. but I'm not currently teaching yoga at a studio, at a studio. but I okay. write sequences for red hot yoga. Oh, I didn't know is, that. Yeah. So I, that's where I, um, first started practicing when I moved back to Atlanta Yeah. And that's where I got my 200 and 500 hour um, certifications. And when I started my internship, my schedule just kind of got crazy. So I backed off of teaching, got but it. I still write some sequences for them. So I'm still kind of involved. Okay. I didn't know you, I didn't know that was an option. That's great. I, you know, I didn't either, but I do love writing sequences. Yeah. I think that's what I, I love more than uh, not the practice itself, right. but that's what is kind of like the, um, the foundation, like the bare bones of yeah. it. And I love doing that. Yeah. But you are born and raised in Atlanta or outside of Atlanta, let's say OTP, yeah. right? So where are you from originally? I'm from Alpharetta. Okay. Yeah. And you grew up there and do you have brothers and sisters? I do. Okay. I have two brothers one older, one younger, so I'm right in the middle. All right. So what's it like growing up with two brothers? I have no siblings, so any any sibling is like, I'm like, what is that like? What is that I, like? Yeah, it's it's complex. Yeah. I think like I love having I love having two brothers. Um, but I feel like that's a very like my emotions are very like now. Mm-hmm. Um Growing up with two brothers was certainly challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do remember there was like, there was a time in my life where I really wanted a sister. Mm -hmm. But I think as I got a little bit older, I saw like the um, benefits of just having like two brothers and kind of like feeling like they would always protect me. And, um, I don't know. I think the experience of having two brothers was different than if I had ever had like a sister. Not that I like think it would have been a bad experience, but it's definitely shaped me into who I am now. Like having just, just brothers. Right. Right. Like probably more just into the sports world and yeah, less of the girly girl type. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And your parents, they were married your whole upbringing and still are, right? Yes, yeah. they are. They are, let's see, they got married in, I believe it was 1988. Okay. Um, so they've been together since then. I'm terrible at math, so I can't do that calculation <laughs> in my head. <laughs> I don't even know. It's like 30 some years. I yeah, think. 30. I know they hit 33 the 30 years. Mark. There yeah, we go. 33 there we mark. go. Yeah. Yeah. And they're actually, um, as we speak, they're moving out of my childhood home, which they bought in like 1990. Okay. Um, so I had a very, like, I guess you could call it stable, like upbringing, mm-hmm. like parents married, um, lived in the same house. Um, pretty much. Yeah. did the same things. What high school did you go to? Alpharetta High School. Okay. All right. So yeah. you didn't go to private school or anything like that. You had a pretty normal, and I love I love how people always lead in with us. They're like, yeah, it was, you know, it's pretty normal. And then as we get into the conversation, they're like, well, that happened when I was little, and that happened when I was little. And it's like, you don't realize that things are abnormal until we start like talking about them, or maybe they have happened and they affect us later in life, which mm-hmm. we're all or we're all the way we are because of something in our past and we all have a story. Totally. Um, so you graduated from Alpharetta and then where did you go to college? I went to Appalachian state, okay. which is in Boone, North yes, Carolina. Uh, yeah. A fr- um, my friend Molly actually went there and oh. I had never heard of it until she mentioned it. I was like, Oh, that sounds like just like a, I feel like, I feel like it's got to be one of those places where you feel like you're in a different world. I don't know. It just <laughs> sounds like you're in like an excluded little like mountain, like mountain area. It totally is like that. Yeah. Like I absolutely loved being there. Yeah. It was kind of the same situation for me though. Like I didn't know App State growing up. Um, I had like a distant relative that went there maybe like four years before me. And so I kind of had heard of it. Uh-huh. And towards like the end of my, or I would say like the middle of my senior year of, of high school, I, (laughs) 
the whole college application situation and the SATs was extremely stressful yeah. for me. And I just, I'm the type of person um, who that will like, something challenging will happen or something very stressful where I just feel very like out of my element mm-hmm. and I sort of just shut down. Mm-hmm. Like I just, not emotionally, but I just very much like won't do anything. Mm-hmm. So towards like the middle of my senior year of high school, my parents were kind of like, well, like you need to take the SATs and like probably apply to some schools. And so I just kind of like did it to do it. Yeah. And the only school I could really like think of that I really like knew nothing about really, but like had sort of this weird idea of like, I should look into this with yeah. App State. And I Googled it and I looked at the pictures online and I was like, oh, I think I want to go here. <laughs> so I applied and I think I got in in maybe March of my senior year, which is like really late. Kind of actually. late. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's um, usually in the fall, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I just was kind of like, whatever, you know, <laughs> I didn't really know what my plans were. Yeah. Um, and I got in and I accepted it before I ever even went up there and saw the school. And, um, it turned like when my mom and I finally went up for a visit, it was the most gorgeous spring day ever. Yeah. And if you've ever been to Boone, uh, which I know you haven't, but like, if you're listening and you've been to Boone, like spring in Boone is absolutely gorgeous. Mm. So it was one of those days and I was just so in love Yeah. and like, I didn't know a single person that was going there. I didn't know a single person who was there. Um, and I would say my move in was very, uh, stressful. Like I was so scared because I didn't know anybody. Um, but I very, very quickly like found my place there. And, you know, I feel for people who have experiences where they get to college Mm -hmm. and it's very like different than Mm -hmm. they thought and, um, have a hard time adjusting, but like, oddly enough, I really never had that experience. Like I immediately fell into it. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Um, I had a hard time ever even like going home or anything like that. Really? Yeah. It was just, I, I don't know. I really just found my place there and my people. And like, it was, it was an absolute blast. Like I loved it. That's kind of different than my college story. <laughs> yeah. Um. So what do you think about, do you, do you still get stressed out when there are like new things in your life like you mentioned that that it's that it was a stressor for you yeah do you recognize that that's kind of happened more than once in your life does it happen even now or do you remember ever happening when you're a kid absolutely I um it's interesting because I was actually talking about this Mm -hmm. earlier today and maybe earlier this week but um I sometimes look back at like my college years Mm -hmm. and I'm like, who was that person? (laughs) Um, I say that because like in high school, oh my God, I was just, I I don't like to, to label and say like, I'm an anxious person Mm -hmm. um, because that like attaches me to it. Mm -hmm. I think more, a more appropriate way of saying it is like, I, have anxiety okay. in certain situations. Um, and I was like that all through high school. Really? Um, did you know you were like that in the moment or is it more just looking back? That's a tough question because I think I did know it, yeah. but I didn't have much validation that it was normal. Right. Or the or, tools to maybe recognize it was a thing. Yeah. Or even that it was something greater than just school stress. Mm. I think for sure that was like not really communicated to me. And it's challenging, I think, looking back and even saying these things because, you know, this is stuff I've talked about in therapy where I'm like, why is, why weren't my parents or my teachers picking it out and saying like, this isn't very healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, these behaviors are a little bit like 
out of the norm. Right. Um, maybe we should talk to someone. Right. Um, but I have to use my knowledge too of like work, like how I work with kids now. Mm -hmm. And like, that is something that's so common is we have to talk to their parents about like education. Right. Um, and so I can't blame my parents or teachers for not recognizing that. Right. Um, it was also a very different time where mental health wasn't necessarily trendy or, um, didn't come with a stigma. Sure. So taking your kids to a therapist for anxiety, like it just wasn't a thing. Yeah. Um, and so I think all that to say, yes, I definitely recognized it in high school, Mm -hmm. but I never, I just kind of thought I had to live with it. Okay. Yeah. So can you give us any examples of the types of behaviors that they didn't recognize or that were off or abnormal? Mm. Um, well, so I actually, I should have started with this. I actually did go to private school. You did? I was okay. in eighth grade. Okay. Very small school, um, here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And, um, I don't think that experience came without anxiety, mm-hmm. but it certainly was like where I started like I started in second grade there so I developed a sense of comfort there Mm -hmm. and then um I switched schools in ninth grade to Alpharetta High School which was a huge shock right right um it was very much like going from 40 kids in my grade to like I think my freshman class was like 500 kids so that was very like I think for anybody that would be overwhelming. Right. And it was very overwhelming for me. I think there were certain situations that definitely like stuck out to me. Like my first day of school, my freshman year was actually my birthday. (laughs) You're like, wow, that's great. Yeah. Birthday present. Right. And I was, it was very, I don't know what the word would be. Um, a little bit embarrassing mm-hmm. to go to my first day of high school, which is like, you know, this quintessential moment. Right. And it was my birthday and literally nobody knew. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody. And like, of course, that's what would happen. Right. right. Like I didn't right. know anyone there. Why would they know my birthday? But it's those experiences where you, where you're um, like, I have maybe I have core beliefs or fears Mm -hmm. and it's in those moments where like those fears to me are validated. Right. And then they become more concrete. So like going back a little bit further, when I was in middle school, um, I actually was just telling my fiance about this the other day (laughs) and I was like, this is something that's come up where I'm like, I repressed for so long and finally I like remember it now. Yeah. But I was um, made fun of a lot by a group of people and this was behind my back. Uh And then one of those people, um, told me about it Uh and told me that they were like making fun of me because I was texting them uh, because apparently it was just so like, um, embarrassing that like I was texting oh, this person. Oh, like how dare you? Yeah. Or like oh. they were just like making fun of the fact that it was me. Um, you know, kids are so mean, They're brutal, so mean, brutal. And that experience thinking back on it now, like I was already, everyone is scared of what people are going to think about yeah. them. Um, I think everyone is scared of what people are going to judge them for. Mm-hmm. So in that moment, I was like validated for like, okay, I guess I was right to think that right. everybody is making fun of me mm-hmm. behind my back and everyone is like doesn't like me right. and is judging me. So things like that definitely stuck with me. And then like yeah. you move forward and like, that's so solidified. And then you move forward to like that first day of school. Right. And no one's saying happy birthday. And like, even though it's logical, yeah, like emotionally it didn't click with me. And yeah. like, so my fears of like, everyone's making fun of me. No one likes me. Um, felt very validated right. in that moment. Right, right. <laughs> and then, yeah. And did your and did your parents try to like set you up for this transition? Because that's a big transition. I have a similar transition. I went to Catholic school, 
and then in sixth grade, it, and Catholic school ended in sixth grade. So after fifth grade, my parents were like, do you want to go to the public school in sixth grade before like junior high starts? And I'm like, yes, I want one year before I go into like junior high, which I guess it really doesn't make a difference. But um, I remember the same sort of thing. Like you just, you kind of, you feel like an outcast because there are these kids that have been together since they were in kindergarten and you mm -hmm. roll in and whatever grade it is. And not to mention like we're both tall human beings. Yeah. So it's really hard to like physically fit in um <laughs> yeah so there's that too you know and I was I don't know about you but I was tall in six I've always been tall yeah for, for my age um but I remember that just being like I don't belong here like take me back to my p private school like all of those sorts of feelings granted we didn't have phones back then so texting wasn't even an option yeah. but um I, I do remember that and it's like it, it stays with you uh as a as you get older and in different, like I can imagine it goes through when you go to college, same sort of thing. When you get your first job, same sort of thing, like all of the new things. So if you had a bad experience with the first new thing, you're always going to have the fear that that's going to happen again with the next first new thing. Mm -hmm. And I just got really lucky in that, um, one of our neighbors knew uh, a woman who had a sixth grader and they were like, can you please make sure that Megan is looked out for and she was quote unquote part of the cool group. So I was kind of like, <laughs> I was like grandfathered in yeah, and I didn't have to deal with it, which was really, really nice, but yeah. still it's terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. Yeah. And, and you know, I, um, I was a very shy kid Yeah, and I'm still a shy person. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think growing up being shy was always like, it was a negative thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried to kind of like convince myself that I wasn't shy, mm -hmm. um, which like psychologically that does a lot of damage when you intentionally try to go against like what you are right. naturally right. Um, because it just creates so much shame. Yeah. And every time you go against you know, what you are, mm -hmm. who you are, mm -hmm. more shame develops mm -hmm. because you don't feel right. Like it doesn't feel like you. Yeah. So it, it's sort of this like back and forth of like, I really want to not be shy. Right. But it's just this constant validation of like, you're not enough. You're not enough. And so when I got to high school, I was like, those first few weeks, I remember being like so overwhelmed mm -hmm. and I was obviously like not super outgoing, not super like trying to make a ton of friends. Um, I'm quite reserved in that way, especially in new situations. Yeah. Um, and I also didn't feel like I was given any like validation of like, you're, you're okay here. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, I felt like this tiny little fish mm -hmm. in this huge pond. And, um, I just felt really, really lost. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I kind of just like accepted it and never really tried to change anything. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like when I got to college, um, physically right I separated from my high school yeah. self I moved like I left the state <laughs> you're like my yeah like see ya yeah. <laughs> my parents were like are you gonna go in state and I literally was like no yeah I can't like I need to I need to go yeah and I think even that of going somewhere where no one knew me right right um and just feeling like I can start over mm -hmm. and you know, my first couple of days in college, I was living in the dorm. So you're around people more, you get more of a right. chance to kind of like be vulnerable with people in that sense. Cause you're living together. Right. So I think like that was my like go ahead pass yeah. when I got to college where I was like this fucking rocks. Yeah. Like I didn't realize that, I could make friends like fast and yeah. people liked me. 
you know? Um, but yeah, high school was shitty. Yeah. I really hated it. <laughs> You're like, eh, actually, I really hated it. Really hated it. I hated so, it a lot. So in college, and I think this is, I think everyone is scared of going away to college. Like, I do think that's a very common thing. Um, but it's almost the best connection because everyone's kind of going through that fear together. Mm. And you get there and you realize, like, for me at least, it was the first time that I realized there are so many different types of people in the world. And it made it okay to be who I was. Because I just kind of, there were so many people, I didn't stand out as much anymore. Yes. Whereas, like, I did in high school. um, Or, like, couldn't hide or whatever, whatever it was. But when you go to college, it's like, okay, you know, I don't even know how many people were in our school. I'd say like 25,000, I think. And you were just a number, like you're really just a number. But at the same time, that can also do the reverse to Mm -hmm. somebody and that you are just a number and that you don't matter. Mm -hmm. So it's about finding that, that group of people. Um, but did the trauma from, from feeling the shame, feeling like, do, should we, would you say that you're introverted or would you just say that you're shy? Like what's the, Mm -hmm. differentiation there because again I don't want to lay it and you I never thought of this but when you say okay I don't consider myself this I have this Mm -hmm. I'm like oh I never like thought of it that way like you're labeling somebody yeah with that versus I just get anxious in these situations versus I'm an anxious person that's a really aha moment for me because I've never thought of it like that like you're just like Oh, I have anxiety. I have depression. Mm-hmm. I have whatever. And that's how I've always talked about myself. Yeah. And I think it's more of not the, I have depression. I have anxiety. Mm-hmm. It's more of the, when you say I am, am depressed, right? Right. It's, it gives that power mm-hmm. like saying, you know, and I know I've talked to you about this yeah. a little bit. Like I, um, I have an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Like I'm in recovery of one. But like that is one that you can easily change and see the the power that it gives it. If I say I am yeah. an eating disorder, like, um, you know, some of it is grammatical, but like, right, right, right. <laughs> but like when you switch it around and yeah. say that, you hear the power that you yeah. give. I like that. that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I've never thought of it that way. I like that. So you're just you're just shy sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes. Exactly. I think I, I, um, that is something, you know, it's funny when I watch like home videos, yeah. I got my dad a VHS last year for <laughs> father's day and we were so excited to like watch all these videos. And it was a very like shocking moment for me to watch some of my old, like when I was very young, you know, yeah. like three or four and I would just stand there mm-hmm. and not say anything. I was not a loud kid at all. Like I was very reserved. Yeah. Um, not reserved in the sense of like, I just wanted to hide, yeah. but I just very much observed what was going on around me. And it was very shocking for me to see that at my age now, because I repressed a lot of that mm-hmm. when I decided that being a little bit shy was wrong. Right. And I like pushed all that down because I didn't want to believe that that's just how I am. That's how you are. Yeah. 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 Did your parents, have you ever talked to them about this? Did they recognize that you were this way when you were younger? Um, yes. So my mom and I have a really close relationship. Mm-hmm. So mama T. Yeah. 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 Sometimes yeah. I have to like think back, like, have I had this conversation? Yeah. The answer is usually yes. Yeah. Because we talk about everything. Um, my dad and I have a good relationship as well, uh-huh. but it's, it's different. Like, yeah. you know, my mom and I, it's like mom, daughter, yeah. um, my dad and I like, um, maybe haven't talked about as many things like that. Sure. But, um, So my older brother is also quite reserved. Okay. Um, And, you know, this is so funny because, like, studying this in school as well, like, the family roles that we Mm -hmm. play, um, they can be very shaped by, like, what others tell us. Yep. 
And I feel like maybe that's sort of what happened. Yeah. So like my older brother, he's only, we're like basically Irish twins. So okay. he's like 14 months older than me. Yeah. Yeah. Again, not great at math. <laughs> um, but he, he was, he's a very like reserved type of person. Um, not super like super outgoing and if he hears this like he's not going to disagree like that's just how he is um and my younger brother is like the opposite he is I wouldn't say he's super loud but he's just one of those people that like if he starts laughing it's so contagious um and we all three have like very different personalities Mm. I guess and Being the middle child, I think growing up and seeing like my older brother being kind of like told, you know, you're kind of the reserved one Mm -hmm. and um, very um, analytical and very good at math and numbers and Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then, you know, my younger brother was just always the one to make make (laughs) us laugh and like just comical relief and just very laid back. He's so laid back. And I think I struggled, um, you know, internally to find what do I bring to the table? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what I, how I naturally am shifted a lot, trying to create my own role, like in the family. Um, so for example, like I didn't think that I was allowed to be shy or think that that was something that I... I struggled with Mm -hmm. because that was kind of like my older brother. And then like, I wasn't super laid back like my younger brother. So I was like somewhere in between. And you know, this is, this is super common with like, um, birth order anyways. And so I think I'm just like textbook middle child in that sense of like, I really struggled to just kind of like find or more or less just be okay with like yeah. who I am right, and not having to have a role. Mm-hmm. Um, I really wanted to have a role in my family. Well, and don't they say like middle children are kind of like the lost ones? Like they kind of just get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Yeah. And I've like talked about this with my mom before and, you know, I, I feel like I should preface this with like, you know, I have... I have no ill will or anything like towards my parents for how they raised me. I really, really don't. Um, But I think everybody has lessons to learn as they get older and everyone has the right to also like look back and say, you know, I felt this when I was this age Mm -hmm. and it kind of like hurt my feelings, you know, and kind of damaged me a little bit. Um, And, you know, I think that's kind of how it was for me. Like I felt that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I never knew how to like verbally express right, it. Right. Yeah. Right. And how, I mean, it's hard to talk to your parents about anything at that mm-hmm. age. It really is. So, but it sounds like you've had those conversations since mm-hmm. and kind of looking back and just reflecting and realizing like, okay, this is kind of why the way I am now, because of this is what I went through and how my parents handled that or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd like to jump into what you mentioned a few moments ago, and that's the eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Because unfortunately, unfortunately, this is a huge common issue with not just females, but all of society. Mm-hmm. And I think it's actually getting worse with um, social media. And the anxiety and the pressures and the judgment and the the shame. And I think a lot of times people are like, I don't have an eating disorder because they, they, they're like, I don't throw up and I eat, but it's like eating disorder is also a very unhealthy relationship to food. Right. That is also, but it's hard because you hear the word disorder and it's like, I don't want to use that word because I don't want to admit that I'm fucked up. That's what we think of when we hear disorder. So I'm really... Um, excited to hear you talk about it, A, because we need to talk about it. It is happening yeah. all over. And B, like, it's part of what, it's part of your journey to get you to what you want to do as a therapist. Mm-hmm. So it's inspiring you. You know, we can either dwell in these trauma, traumatic situations and these things that we've gone through 
and use them as an excuse for the rest of our life to be a certain way or to be mad or angry or upset. Yeah. Or we can use it to inspire us and you're doing that to try to help other people. Yeah. So we'll just put that out there. Yeah. Um, but I would love to hear you open up about how how it first started. Yeah. Let me grab a sip of water. Yeah. <laughs> The timeline of this is something that has actually changed over the years. Um, Because you've done discovery? Yeah, I think I've done a lot more of diving into like where and when it actually started. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't I don't think it was like a specific event, Mm -hmm. but I do have like flashbacks of being in middle school Mm -hmm. and being a cheerleader and um, going to the candy aisle with my cousins and picking out candy to like watch movies and picking the sugar-free kind because I was like nervous that I was going to gain weight and not be able to be the the flyer, Mm. things like that. And, um, you know, I was a gymnast growing up. I competed, um, I mean, it was all I did for a really long time. Um, I think I quit when I was like 10 or 11, which seems so young, but it, my gymnastics career felt long. Yeah. Well, those are formative years too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's a big chunk of your growing up. Yeah. It was, and I, you know, it's interesting because like, I know a lot of people have had experiences with gymnastics and it leading to eating disorders, but like, I don't know if I necessarily felt that way. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really until I was more or less like on this team situation, like in middle school Mm -hmm. where, um, the weight issue was actually being discussed. And I actually had more like of an awareness of myself. Yeah. Um, which tends to happen when kids become like, I think eight is normally the age where, you actually have awareness of like you yourself Mm -hmm. and that's when you actually start noticing that other people are noticing you. Right. Um, so I would say that there was not an unhealthy relationship then, but I, I was getting ideas. Okay. And then in high school, um, I want to say it was maybe like my 10th and 11th grade years. Um, I, again, going back to, you know, my experience in high school and I just, I had no friends. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this always makes me really emotional because like that was something I told myself constantly was like, or try, I guess tried to run from like deny that statement Mm -hmm. of like, I don't have any friends. Um, Like, I legitimately did not have a support system. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, studying it now and looking back, I think the change of events here was I felt very out of control. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt a lot of shame. I didn't have anybody to turn to Mm -hmm. and I wanted to control something. Mm -hmm. So I started to do that and, you know, lunchtime in general, like for me in high school was Mm -hmm. so stressful. Like I, it's like, um, it's like, Mm re-traumatizing sometimes when I think about it and like my body remembers it yeah like when lunchtime would happen and I would either I would go into the library and like we weren't allowed to eat food in there but like I didn't have anybody to sit with Mm -hmm. so I like felt like that was my only choice so I would go in there and I would have to like sneakily eat my lunch because I didn't want to get in trouble right And I think over time, I just was like, I'll just stop 
eating it, mm. you know? And, um, yeah, it just, it was a very like stressful time for me. Yeah. Um, and you're how old? 28. No, at the time. Oh, I was. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I answered that one real quick. Ah! I win. I win. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even have to do math. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I was probably 15, yeah. 16. Yeah, that's kind of when mine, mine started a little bit early. Well, looking back, same sort of idea. Yeah. It's like I remember, and then you're like, wait, but I remember that earlier than than what I originally thought. Yeah. It's kind of where it, it catapulted. So, yeah. so did you, I mean, again not labeling labels, but did you become anorexic at the time? No, I, I really don't think I did. I think I had, um, disordered eating. Mm-hmm. I think I just like, didn't. Will you have explain a... the difference? Cause this is, I'm glad that you're on. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. glad that you're on because there are so many terms out there and I think it's, again, they're all unhealthy, Yeah, but I think it's important to understand the, uh, the difference between them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Disordered eating, I feel like, is having a very, like, unbalanced and unhealthy relationship with food. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am I feel like I'm going to do a bad job explaining this. But, like, <laughs> I think it's kind of this, you know, honestly, our diet culture, yeah. what it promotes is disordered eating. Because you're basically telling people, like, it's okay to, you know, fast for 16 hours right. and then eat, like that naturally will just create a bad relationship with, with food. And then ultimately it creates a bad relationship with your body, Mm -hmm. like with how you see yourself. Um, because you won't, you feel like you are not good if you are like not following a certain diet or whatever it is. Or you're hungry and you need something, but you're like, Oh, it's, I'm in, not in my time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And you know, looking at like actual eating disorders, um, it's a very like primary mental illness. Yeah. So it's more or less like it, it probably starts as disordered eating mm-hmm. and then it becomes a, uh, very, very obsessive, um, almost uncontrollable, like fear, mm. fear based, um, disorder where you, are so fearful of like eating, Mm. you know, the idea of eating, the idea of, of being around food, of being in a situation where there's food is like panic attack inducing. Is it fear of the food or is it fear of what the food will do as far as putting on weight? Like how is, okay. okay. It can be, there's a, there's like a a scale. I feel like, um, we do, uh, or I mean, you can diagnose someone that actually has like fear of, of food. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a little bit different, okay. but I guess it does come down to like fear of what the food will do Got it. to your body. Um, and it's very, very control based. Like, so were you afraid of, beca- so at this point you had already, you're done with gymnastics, you know, you're, you didn't have the pressure of having to be a flyer. So yeah. that weight thing wasn't an issue it was it more of just being able to still fit in like what was it about the food that became unhealthy to be honest I felt like it was the only relationship I really had okay so I wanted to have control over it when in reality it turned and had control over you at some point yeah right and I mean if anyone is listening and under and I mean you too like I if you understand what it's Mm -hmm. like to have either disordered eating or an eating disorder, it's like truly it becomes like a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, everyone has a relationship with food, but this becomes like sliding into like a very toxic relationship. Like you could even compare it to a toxic relationship with a person where it's, it is a relationship. You become very codependent on it. Um, like for example, for me, like, you know, I feel like a lot of people think that those who have eating disorders, like just don't think about food. Like they just don't Mm. eat. 
but it's like the opposite. Right. You're so codependent on food that you can't stop thinking about it. But it's like this cyclical, like pounding thoughts of, you know, how am I going to get out of eating this meal next? Or how am I going to control my next portion? Um, or whatever it is, like it becomes all you can think about, right. which is very similar to like a very toxic codependent relationship with like a person. Right. Right. Um, and that was like the only relationship I really had in high school. Like I didn't have friends to talk to. Um, so I just talked to myself mm. constantly and it was about the food, but it like, it was a very like separate sort of conversation. Um, you know, I'll, I'll briefly mention this, the, the type of therapy approach that I really am interested in and kind of like leaning towards is called internal family systems, okay. which was designed for, to help people with eating disorders. And like, it sort of, um, hypothesizes that like we all are made up of these different parts. So like when we hear our thoughts, yeah. it really does sometimes sound like a different part of us is talking mm. And so that's my best way of explaining it mm -hmm. was like, I felt like I kind of was in a relationship um, with someone or yeah. something. Yeah. It was me, but like I was, it was a different part of me. Yeah. So somebody asked me about, um, I was on a podcast like a year ago and we got into this and there was a huge chunk of my life where I was bulimic. Um, and it's so hard to explain to somebody that hasn't gone through it because mm -hmm. they're like, how can you do that? And it's, this is what I said. And I'm like, have you ever like blacked out and you wake up and you're like, what happened last night or what I do? Yeah. It's kind of that feeling like you go through the process and you just do it. Yeah. And you don't even know that you're doing it until after. And you're like, what did I just do to myself? And then, but you feel better. So it makes it okay. It's like, you don't, you're physically doing it, but mentally you don't know what's happening or another part of your brain or like, it's, it's you, but it's not you that's yeah. controlling it. It's so hard to explain, but it sounds very similar to what you went through. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that it's like a relationship with a different part of Aaron or different part of who we are, even though it's still our physical body making yeah. these choices, but there's a different part of our brains making the choice at the same time and our yeah. body just responds to it. And I think it's important to note that like, it does us no good to shame those mm -hmm. parts of us. Like, um, that's kind of what this approach in therapy is talking about. It's saying like, it's working towards having a better relationship mm -hmm. with all your parts because really, um, you know, ooh, and I was explaining this to my mom the other day, like, you know, self harm. Um, I have, I've never self harm in the, in, the sense of cutting myself right. or physically hurting myself right. in that way. Um, and my mom was telling me, you know, it's hard for her to understand that too. And I said, it's the same. I'm sure she won't mind me saying this, but she struggled with an eating disorder as well mm. when she was in college. And I said, it's literally the same thing. Yeah. When you restrict food, right. when you're doing that, right. you're doing it to punish yourself. Mm -hmm. And the way that we look at self-harm, like, or, you know, any, anything like that mm -hmm. is to say like that part of you is, is just trying to protect you. Right. Like it's trying to protect you from this really vulnerable part that is really, really hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And so in healing from either like an eating disorder or self-harm or mm -hmm. depression or whatever it is, like accepting that, you know, that part, you shouldn't feel shame about right. it. It's like, it was there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, it was trying to protect you. Well, and it's very hard. And I use this term quote unquote, but, um, it's very hard to fix something that you're not ready to admit is going on. Mm -hmm. And it's not even about fixing. It's just understanding. You're like, okay, I do this because of something that I've gone through. Yeah. So less about fixing, but still you can't change something until you can admit that it's there, until you can admit that it's valid. Yeah. So you went to college mm -hmm. and then um, did this continue throughout college? Because it sounds like your college days were really good. Did it yeah. go away or was it always still there? 
Yeah. And, you know, I feel like that's what commonly happens, right? When like certain stressors are eliminated Mm -hmm. and you don't feel the need to protect yourself Mm -hmm. so much anymore. Um, But I think my, towards my senior year of college, like I definitely, um, that is, I feel like when I actually like went from it being more of like a disordered eating Mm -hmm. thing to like an actual eating disorder where okay. it felt very controlled, yeah. very like, um, yeah, just very controlled. Yeah. Um, and I, I do feel like it came on based out of the fear of what am I going to do next? Right. And this fear, the pressure, yep. you know, and, and leaving college mm-hmm. and like going and, and starting something new and starting something fresh. So, and I, I, I think it's also worth mentioning that like this is nothing against my older brother at Mm -hmm. all, but my, he is very, very smart Mm -hmm. and very successful. Um, he played college golf and it's natural to be a younger sibling and to compare yourself Mm -hmm. and being as close in age as we were, as we are. Um, I definitely compared myself to him a lot sure. and you know, that started early on, yeah. but I think in college when things were starting to wrap up, I definitely started comparing and comparing and comparing and really just like not feeling like I would ever be able to reach a type of success that like he would reach. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't have any. I didn't have any knowledge or like evidence that that was going to happen, but I I felt pretty certain, you know, based on like how he performed academically and in in college and all of that. So, um, I was very like, not, I felt okay about myself. Like I felt pretty good about myself, but like deep down, I didn't believe that I had it in me to ever do anything like really worthwhile Mm -hmm. with like my life. Mm. Um, and so I think my like eating disorder patterns like ramped back up in a way of being like to help me establish some sort of identity that I thought I would be proud of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, we hear this a lot, like with like people and who have mental illness, Mm -hmm. like sometimes they like, lean into that identity of having a mental illness because it's the only thing that they feel makes them stand out. Right. So like going back to feeling kind of lost as a middle child, like I going out of college, like just felt like I, um, subconsciously want to do something that like makes people notice me. Right. So, and you know, I've always been like a tall, slender person. So like, I think it was very easy for me to like, then take it down that path because then people started noticing. Mm. And I don't know if you had this experience, but it wasn't ever like, I'm worried about you. It Mm -hmm. was like, you look good. Yeah. So like, I kind of liked it. Yeah. And it was like this one thing that made me like, stand out and like gave me an identity and like very much like made me very superficial, but also I was like, well, I don't feel like I'm intelligent enough to, to really be super successful in like a job. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll just like be really skinny. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We don't mean to laugh, but we are both laughing because it makes total sense to us. Yeah. If you haven't been through this, it's very hard to understand where we're coming from, but a hundred percent. I, I lived in LA and I was like, and, and, and we also, it was, it's, it was easy for me to hide because I was so tall. Like yeah. I can gain and lose 20 pounds and nobody really knows. Like, same, you know, same. we just have so many places to put weight. And then when we contrary, when we lose weight, it's hard to tell, you yeah, know, yeah. but when you become ultra thin, mm-hmm. I did have a couple of people, like I had one, um, I remember being home at Christmas and my best friend's brother like made a backhanded comment and I was just like, oh, he knows. And I was like, oh my God, he knows. And yeah. I just kept moving forward. So do you think anyone going through 
you're so now you're 22 coming out of college yeah. did anyone know this was kind of getting worse and perpetuating into a full-blown eating disorder yeah so my um my like best friend noel um i hope she listens to this but she's like she was my best friend all through college she's my maid of honor now uh-huh. and um i told her one day yeah because i was really struggling um with doing it alone mm. and i told her that i felt like i was struggling with it um but i never really like took it you know into okay let me like go through a healing journey now right right um i think it felt really good for me to tell somebody mm-hmm. but i didn't really like change anything um and you know i to be very very honest there was a part of me that like wanted other people to know Mm -hmm. like again like I I wanted someone to notice me for something Mm. so like and that's that's a hard like statement to make because it's so shitty right but it's it's like shame in it yeah it's like I wanted I I wanted some attention yeah really yeah like I wanted her to know I wanted her to know because she was my friend but I Mm -hmm. also wanted her to know because I was like I just want, like, I, I want some attention. Yeah. You know, that was my call for attention. Yeah. Um, and it kind of just went on like that for several years. And when I got, when I moved back home, I moved back home when I was 23. Um, I, that was when I felt like, okay, I want to, I want to change some things, Mm -hmm. but I kind of just did the opposite. Like, so when I was in college, like what I would do and, you know, I hope this isn't triggering at all, but like, I was very keen on like the, the, just restricting completely Mm -hmm. and like drinking. Mm. Um, and that was just sort of like my, that was my routine and it didn't feel that abnormal. Yeah. 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 And then when I moved home, I think I I shifted more into, like, an orthorexic type Mm. of situation where, like, I thought I was getting better by working out and eating more, but I just became very obsessed with, like, eating the right things. Right. Um, So, like, I think mentally it was, like, a mindfuck kind of because Mm -hmm. I thought I was – I thought I was – doing something right um but i think it just made me even worse and i actually got even skinnier then yeah and that was actually when my mom uh, several people actually told me yeah um i was gonna ask about like did your mom know what was going on or she have an idea because if she's been through it yeah it's easier to recognize something but it's yeah. almost harder to to talk about it because you know, your it's your daughter. It's scary. Yeah. I, I think it's really tough and I I we have talked about it. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. but she said it to me one day. She was like, you know, you're just getting really skinny. Um, you just need to watch that. And thinking about it now, like I really understand and feel and like empathize with what she was probably going through too, because sitting here as I am now, like I can't lie and say, I don't still struggle with like Mm -hmm. the same types of things. Like I'm light years ahead, but like I still struggle. Yeah. So the thought of having a daughter that came to me and said that she was struggling with an eating disorder or I noticed it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I like, I don't know if I would be able to, to have that conversation because like that is like, you know, you're still struggling with it a little bit or like still have those tendencies. So then you're like, did I do that? And then also like, how can I even have this conversation when like, I don't feel fully recovered? I, I hear that, but I also think one of the best ways to deal with something is to be able to relate on the same level. Yeah. And you might be helping somebody, 
not by giving them advice or saying this is how I got through it because if you're still going through it, you can't. But you can say, oh, this is what happens to me when I go through this and this. And you actually make it okay to have these thoughts and these feelings versus um, feeling like a mother has to fix a daughter, right? Yeah. So maybe it's just more about being able to relate and being like, well, I went through that or I'm going through that. And this is when it's worse for me or this is when it's better for me. And actually like talk it out. I, I interviewed on, on last week's episode um, – uh, Gretchen and she mentioned her her mom has had severe depression her entire life and Gretchen has some anxious moments and she's supposed to go home at Thanksgiving and her and her mom is it's an interesting relationship but um her mom's not really a mom not mm-hmm. really she'll kind of check out for two weeks and not call or check in with Gretchen or whatever it's it's very interesting situation but she said the first time I ever felt like my mom and I related on a human emotional level is when um I had a little panic attack before going home at Thanksgiving because she didn't want to leave and leave her dogs and she called her mom she's like I'm so sorry I'm not coming home for Thanksgiving and it was the first time her mom was like oh my gosh I totally understand I know what Mm -hmm. that feels like Mm -hmm. so instead of like having to give advice and like want to mend somebody just sitting there and saying like you're not alone you're not crazy for having these feelings or these thoughts and they're very valid and I've had them too maybe in a different capacity so I wonder if we can just open up the conversation more and not always have to feel like we have to even as a therapist yeah you know like your role is not to necessarily fix someone or always have to diagnose, but to really listen and to make it okay for somebody to have, you know, thoughts that, that aren't normal or thoughts that are really scary. Like you make it okay for that. Yeah. So I think it's kind of the same role as a, as a mother daughter. It's, um, it doesn't make it easier to watch your kid go through something like that, but being able to relate is, is a lot easier, I think. Yeah. So what, what have you done to get to a healthy place? Cause I look at you now yeah. and granted, uh, this is somebody from the outside, but <laughs> I just took your class recently. You yeah. look stronger than you ever have. Cause I'll be really honest. We met at cycle bar. Yeah. That was five years ago and you were real thin Yeah, and I recognized it. You posted something about like what you, you had this like nut mix and I was like, gosh, I feel like she's like, I feel like she struggles with food and I was still mm. kind of struggling in my sense too but it didn't deter me from wanting to be around you and like I just recognized it yeah and you were really really thin and now I looked at you on the podium I'm like you're really fit (laughs) I was like you're really strong like I'm like oh I want abs like that (laughs) oh that's I that's awesome I literally like you know I have days where I'm like I haven't made any progress Mm. and then I have days where I'm like actually I have because these things that used to be not even like hard, but impossible. Yeah. I just do them now. Right. And, you know, I think there's a whole lot of like stories in there. Like, you know, when I, when we met at cycle bar, that was, I think maybe the year after that. Um, I really thought I was in a good place. Um, and you know, I just don't, I wasn't like, I, I, I wanted to be, I was ready to do the work, but I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what the work was. Um, and I think being in fitness, it's scary because you feel like that's your job in some ways. So like, I was like thinking that I was doing the work right? because I, you know, I had that position, but, um, I, you know, it's such a weird and like whirlwind of a story (laughs) because it got me to somewhere that's excellent, but like it sucked going through it. And I think that I've definitely like talked a little bit about it with you, but, um, towards the end of probably like a year after like you left Mm -hmm. there, um, I started dating someone He was not, I'll just like say it as it is, like I didn't like him. Mm. And 
he was a very controlling person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to be honest, like I'm working through like a lot of this currently mm-hmm. and I repress so much of like our relationship because I just like did not want to remember any of yeah. it. And, you know, like my brain was protecting me, but I just like didn't, I didn't like him. Mm. But I was in a very vulnerable place. Um, I was not feeling great about myself. And I really just like kind of let him start this relationship with me. And like, I think that's really challenging to navigate for like myself because... Um, you know, physically what that meant was it's just like hard to even think about Mm -hmm. because it was very violating. Mm -hmm. Um, and somehow my brain like Allowed it tried to, happen. to Yeah, tried to, like, let it be okay mm-hmm. and let it be... I think I thought it was, like, what I deserved. Mm-hmm. And um, so, anyways, like, that started. And I really, like, convinced myself that, I, like, I was happy. Um, and there's probably a whole lot in that that time frame that, like, I don't even remember still. Right, right. Um, but I remember, like, little glimpses and little things here and there it was like an eight month long relationship but there are like some signs as like we progressed in our relationship where I was like I don't really like feel super safe yeah like with you but you know like we talked about earlier you know codependent relationships are very toxic and it's very easy to get wrapped up in one when like you're not feeling when you're not like able to love yourself or even give yourself self-compassion, maybe not even self-love, just like give yourself self-compassion. I wasn't in that space. And I think he really took advantage of me. And, um, you know, ironically, I was really still struggling with like my eating and like, at this point, because of the relationship, I was also super, like, I was very, very, very much struggling with, um, like, having anxious tendencies and just really feeling anxious yeah, all day long. all the time. So while I was trying to recover from not eating, mm-hmm. like, restricting, I was trying to eat, but I was so anxious all the time that I was not hungry. Mm. So... And I, I think all this stemmed from just being in this relationship. And he actually like forced me to go see a therapist mm. and basically told me like it was like this ultimatum thing. And he was like, either you get better or like I'm not going to date you. And it was very much this like abuse. It was like a very much abusive relationship in a emotional verbal sense mm-hmm. at that point where I felt like that was my only option. I felt like I could not leave him or he could not leave me and I would be okay, Mm. which is actually hilarious. It's not hilarious, but like (laughs) I was doing these other things in my life where I was like leading things. Like I was, I was being independent, but like in this sense, I was like scared to death. Yep. So I actually went, like, I started going to see this therapist, and she was amazing. And um, through our work, it just became very obvious that she was like, you need to get out of this relationship. (laughs) This is the problem. (laughs) Yeah, like, it's hilarious that, like, this is what brought you here. But, like, you know, and it is is funny because, like, in most abusive, like, relationships, like, you know, that would be so off limits right. because he like normally the abuser would be so scared. Yeah. Of, like like don't someone turning. Me. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I'm very wow. sociopathic. Yeah. And, um, so I started 
having like a lot of second thoughts, but was so scared. Like I didn't think that I was going to be worth anything if Uh I left. I didn't Uh think I would ever find love again. Didn't think I would ever find anyone. And anyways, um, in like December of that year, um, there was one night and one night where we were like drinking at my condo and actually my cousin was there. Um, which is like so hard for me to think about, but, um, it was actually her 21st birthday, like weekend. And so she was staying with me and he got like really drunk and, um, was saying like the most inappropriate things to my cousin, like things I would never even repeat. Like I can't even think about what it, what he said. And I kept saying like, you know, stop, stop, stop. And he was like, you know, just no. And I got like really fed up with him and I like kind of like pushed him. Mm. And anyways, it turned into a, a very physical like altercation. Really? Um, and he actually like, this is like so scary to think I was there, Mm -hmm. but he actually like grabbed a gun out of Mm. my room that he had been hiding there and like pointed it at me. Um, and my cousin was there and I like told her to go like in the room and thinking back on it, actually not thinking back on it now, every time I think back on it, I wish I would have called the police. Uh, but I didn't. And he ended up leaving. It was like very, very traumatic for me. Um, but you know, the really, really hard part for me to admit is that I didn't break up with him then. Really? No, I continue because I literally felt like I couldn't. Right. It was, it's so sick. No, I it's think so this, sick. Is, this happens all the time. It does. And it, it's, I think I'm more saying it's sick on his part. Sure. Sure. That sure. That sure. like he, he someone a could human do that. being could do that. Yeah. yeah someone yeah. could do that. Right. And so... Um, we actually like, I still tried to like mend the relationship and everything like after that. And then finally after like a month, I like, we ended things Mm. and like, it was only then that I could see like just what I went through and like how much it damaged me like emotionally and like, um, also how free and like how good I felt without him. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it was really then that I actually could start working on Jeez, myself. Right. But, you know, on paper that sounds easy. Right. But I actually, it, it wasn't easy at all. Um, I actually met Vaughn, my fiance, yes. right after that. Which you, you are getting married this year, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And I actually like have thought about this a lot because... In my mind, like, and even now, like, I don't think I was ready at all to meet someone and start mm-hmm. dating. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's just sometimes, like, how the universe works. Yeah. And, like, I think he was brought into my life and we started dating. And that was just, like, how it happened. And I think I was actually, like, so fucked up from that situation and just so numb, so emotionally broken. Yeah. Um, that he was just like a breath of fresh yeah, air yeah. and actually taught me to like, not even love myself really, but to he feel. just taught me how to be like comfortable. Yeah. And only recently have I realized that like, while I thought I was dealing with that trauma, like that first year after when I was with Vaughn and I, and I said like, you know, I'm working through it. Like. I don't think that was it at all. I think actually like last year, like in October, which is almost three years later Mm -hmm. was when I actually felt ready to work on it. Mm. Um, you know, I think Vaughn came into my life and really in a sense, just like saved me Mm -hmm. and allowed me to just be and not get into all that just yet yeah. and just gave me this chance to kind of coast for a, yeah. a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And just kind of process. Yeah. Like, this is what happened to me. Right. Right. Um, it's not who I am, but it happened to me. Right. But also like 
everything feels awful when we're in the moment. Mm -hmm. Everything is, is everything is everything when you're dealing with it. And I always try to put things into perspective, like, okay, six months from now or a year from now, this situation that I'm really hurting from isn't going to matter as much as I think it's going to matter. And it sounds like this other guy, as traumatic and awful as he was, like, you almost had to hit rock bottom with this guy to be able to allow yourself to deal with all the shit in your life and allow it to surface and start to do the work and move in the other direction. Yeah. And the crazy part is he introduced you to this therapist that sounds like, do you still see the same person? I actually don't see her anymore. Um, She moved on to doing something different in like a school. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, But going to a therapist is hard. Yeah. It's a really hard thing for a lot of people because it's again going back to saying like okay I'm admitting I have a problem it's like oh that that mentality yeah admitting that I need help and opening and wounds. opening up yeah <laughs> so this guy like got you to go to a therapist right. and it's, it's it's hilarious you said that like you just started the journey in October and I want to sit here and be like no he started the journey for yeah. you that oh, those yeah, yeah. right but but it's like okay without him maybe you wouldn't have hit rock bottom kind yeah. of and gone through all of that and been ready to meet Vaughn. So yeah. You and know. it's, it's funny because like after that happened and yeah. after we like broke up and I, you know, tried to get my life together, like that was when I, I had been thinking about it, but I became much more adamant about it right yeah. after that happened of like, I need to do this. Right. Like I need, I want to be a therapist right. and it wasn't just like, I want to help people. It was like, I need to help people Mm -hmm. who are feeling and going through things that are like that. Yeah. And letting them know that it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to feel like is your fault. Right. Um, and so I actually like that was in January and I like applied like crazy in January to get into grad schools and, um, I got in and I started like that February. Mm-hmm, so like, mm-hmm. like a month and a yeah, half later. Yeah. And honestly, it was the perfect like timeline because I started and I, I did coursework for two years. And then last August was when I started my internship and I, I think I was, like I said, I was just sort of like, I was living, I was right. being present, I was doing the work. Um, someone said yesterday that I was working with said like, he felt like he was just like an aunt who is just like still doing the work, still there, but sometimes you're just like, that's all you can right. do. Right. So I think for two years, that's kind of what I was doing. And um, then by the time that my internship started, and I had the opportunity to start getting out in the field was like the perfect timing for like now I'm now I'm ready to to do my own work and yeah. like actually do that and now being in the field and like being with clients and and all that it's like it couldn't have come any sooner and shouldn't have come any later it was mm. like a good time um and I'm really grateful for that like really grateful that I decided to take that journey, but also so grateful that like I had the time to just like study and learn and like do that rather than having to like be pushed out into it. I wasn't not ready. I wasn't ready at all. I mean, it's all in somebody else's timing, right? It's really never about what we want or, or where we are. And, um, it's such a cool journey that's to know you um years ago and to know that that was a really difficult time and to now see you yeah and so much can change in just a few years um I think a lot of people are intimidated by that because they don't want to take the time to do it Mm -hmm. but you have two choices I feel like in life either you live this way forever so you live in that that trauma that emotion and things will come up for the next 
you know, God willing, 40, 50 years um, for you even more. I'm a lot older than you are, but, <laughs> um, or you have the choice to take the three, four, five, ten years, however long it takes to go through the process and to try to live differently so that the next yeah. 30, 40, 50 years are joyful. Yeah. And it's really daunting when you're in it. It's really, it can be really depressing when you start and you say, okay, this is who I am and this is where I want to be at some point. Mm-hmm. But it's either that or just kind of giving up and being like, I don't really want to do the work. So I'm just going to be hateful or spiteful or sad or yeah. have this eating disorder forever. Yeah. Right. So that's what it comes down to. So I'm, I'm so, I'm proud of you. I'm so <laughs> honored that you chose this platform to share your story. And I know it will definitely, um, definitely impact a lot of people in many different ways. And I'm going to open it up to anything else you, you want to say about your journey and your story. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I um I love hearing other people's stories yeah. and you know, I think coming on and and wanting to tell my story, I mentioned to you like before we started, mm-hmm. I was a little scared because I I didn't want to wrap anyone into sure. it and like make them feel like they've forced my story to sure. be a certain way. We all have experiences that influence yep. us. And literally no one can be perfect. No family is perfect. Mm-hmm. No relationship mm-hmm. is perfect. So like I really try to own my story and yep. be like, just like what you said, like decide now, where do I go? Right. Like, and not be resentful right. for anything. Um, and just move forward. Yeah. Um, I think what I would say to anybody who's listening, who maybe is struggling with something mm-hmm. similar, um, is, well, I guess I, number one, I would say try to find somebody to talk to. Yes. Um, Always. I, that's not reserved for people who have mental illness. Yeah. It's not reserved for being at your rock bottom. Um, I think therapy is beneficial for literally anybody. Yeah. Um, it's preventative and also healing. And so I just, I always encourage that for anybody, um, and if you think that it's going to make you a certain way, like just try it yeah. and see how it goes. And try, um, and, and I want to piggyback on that. Um, if one therapist isn't yeah. your cup of tea, try somebody else. Yes. It can take two, three people, like just like friends, like you meet a group of people and you're like, mm, those aren't my people. Yeah. You have a doctor and you're like, eh, I don't vibe with this doctor. Same thing with a therapist. So yes. don't give up after your first person if you guys don't click. Absolutely. Yeah. There are so many therapists and so many different like ways of approaching yeah. clients. So I guarantee you there's someone out there for you if you feel like yeah. giving up. Yeah. And I guess like the second thing I would say is just, you know, really just keep trying, Mm -hmm. um, just keep working. I know that that's like cliche and it's maybe even frustrating to hear when you're at a certain part of your journey. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But like, I actually told a client this the other day, I was like, I am so thankful that I kept trying. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, I think it's also important to share that like right now where I am is not like the end of my journey. Yeah, like I it. have so many days of struggle. Yeah. yeah. Um, this week has been like such a struggle <laughs> for me. So like, it's not about achieving perfection, right. but I think it's so helpful to like, as you're on your journey to look back and think how you've made progress. Yes. And as you're on your journey, also writing down or verbally stating what progress means to you and what it looks like. Sure. I like that. Yeah. Because like, it's not a goal necessarily of like, I want to be here. Right. It's sometimes saying like, I just want to have like 
one day a week where I can give myself Mm self-compassion. Like even starting there is like so monumental. Yeah. So assessing what progress like looks and feels like to you is so important. Yeah. That's huge. I love that. Well, thank you so much. Where can we find you? What's your handle? Uh, It's at turn underscore Aaron Mason. And it's, um, Mason spelled M E A S O N. Oh my God. This whole time I've always called you Aaron Mason. <laughs> I was about to say, I've that you always thought it was Mason. You know, what's funny is Ashley, she didn't know it was Mason until like maybe a year ago. And she heard my, it on my, my voicemail. You should see my mouth. Uh, it's like <laughs> on the ground right now. This entire time I thought like I've called, like called Ma- Mama T is is Teresa Meeson? Like, yeah. Why did I think? Well, because it's M E A, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it phonetically doesn't make any <gasps> oh sense. Oh God! You so should, like, you should have stopped me in the beginning, but like, that's not how you pronounce my last you name. You know, it's one of those things where like I don't even notice it yeah, yeah, anymore. Yeah. Like, and it doesn't offend me. Like, oh my I'm gosh. not like adamant. Like, say my name right. I just don't even hear it anymore. But. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's soon to not be there you Mason, go. There you so go. it'll, I'll have like a very basic, what's the white new, girl what's, name. Gonna, what's the new name? What's the new <laughs> Stevens? Okay. Well, yeah. I would say Mason's pretty basic. No offense. It is I basic. Mean, it is basic, but the like, spelling. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> Stevens. Makes me stand out. So you'll be Aaron Mason Stevens. I think so. Yeah. Gonna, yeah okay. Yeah. Or are you going to drop it? Yeah. I don't know, but I did say if I ever go back and like get my doctorate, yeah, I think I would actually like, I know everyone's like the, the trendy thing is like, he didn't earn my doctorate, so he's not going to get oh, the, geez. but I feel like Dr. Stevens is a very like Grey's Anatomy doctor yes. name. So I think I'd keep it like okay. Stevens. Okay. I like it. <laughs> I like when's the big day. November 6th. All right. Well, thank you for sharing your story thank and you. I'm excited to be part of your journey. Thank you so much. You're welcome. (laughs) Thank you for listening to this episode of the Six Feet Above podcast. I'm your host, Megan Armstrong. Subscribe so you never miss another episode as a new episode is released every Tuesday. And if you're enjoying the series, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. Follow the show on Instagram at Six Feet Above Podcast to keep the conversation going and feel free to reach out to me directly at Megstagram11. This episode is a product of Audiographies, produced by Megan Armstrong and Denor Sapolia, edited by Jacob Smolian, and the music is by Keenan Willis, funded by yours truly. I'll see you next time.